let's open up in a word of prayer. And we will continue our study through Exodus. Um, Lord willing, we'll finish next week. I got a lot to cover these last six chapters. I'm going to try to do in two weeks. I mean, we've been going really slow, methodical through this. Uh, a lot of the last uh, six chapters, there's a lot of um, repetition. So I'll go through some of this quickly. Other things we'll hone in on, but let's just open up in a word of prayer. Father, once again, we thank you for the privilege of coming here to worship you uh, in freedom. Uh, we thank you for the freedoms that we have in Christ, the freedoms we have in our country. We pray, Lord, that we would stand uh, strong in you. Uh, we'd stand strong for your word. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would stir us up to love and good works. We pray that we would have ears to hear what your Spirit is saying to us from the living Word of God. And Lord, we thank you that you've given us your Word. We can hold fast to your promises. Uh, we thank you that you challenge us, you exhort us, you encourage us, you bless us. There's so much we can find as we just spend time each day studying your living Word. And so we pray, Father, that you would give us ears to hear what your Spirit is saying to us as we uh, continue our study in this amazing book of Exodus. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, let's turn to Exodus 35. And for some of you who are wondering, because I had a lot of people last week, so you're going to Ukraine, huh? I was like, I didn't say anything. Uh, I was volunteered. But uh, we're praying about it. We'll see if the Lord opens that door. I'd love to go and uh, minister to the uh, chaplains and, and those there in Ukraine. Um, it's kind of what we do with the Go Give Hope in India. When I go to India, it's building up the church planters, teaching them the Word of God, and so um, whatever doors the Lord opens. But anyways, you're turning to Exodus 35. Last time, uh, we looked at God renewing His covenant with Moses on behalf of the children of Israel. As you remember, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, the people talked Aaron into building this gold calf, and they're worshiping this gold calf, and they're bowing down before, they're celebrating, and they're committing all kinds of immorality. And as a result, 3,000 Israelites are put to death. Um, Moses throws down the Ten Commandments. Uh, God's about to judge them. Moses intercedes. And so he calls him back up on to Mount Sinai, where he'll spend another 40 days and 40 nights up there. And he receives the Ten Commandments once again. And so God is renewing his covenant with the Israelites. And so these final chapters deal with Moses telling the people all that God had spoken to him and how they are going to build the tabernacle. And the, the final five chapters deal with building the tabernacle, the place of worship. This is where they would uh, worship the Lord for the next 500 years until the building of Solomon's temple. And then for another thousand years, they would worship the Lord at the temple. But God's presence was here uh, in their midst. And remember, he moved outside the camp. Now he's back in the camp. When they get this dedicated, we'll see the glory of the Lord is going to come down and he will uh, dwell in their midst. Now, why was this tabernacle so important? Because this is the place where God met his people. Uh, again, we were created for fellowship. We were created to be in an intimate relationship with God, but because of sin, we were separated from God. But the whole Bible is about God's desire to reconcile us back to Himself. God is holy. God is pure. We're not holy. We're not pure. And so the only way sinful human beings could be reconciled to God is through the shedding of the blood of innocent, spotless animals. And so they had to have a substitutionary sacrifice for sin. That was the only way they could approach God. And so as the people took their innocent lamb or goat or bull or turtle doves, and they would have these sacrificed, they realized that that innocent animal was dying because of them. And it weighed on their hearts because they were responsible for killing that innocent animal because of their sin. But that blood that was shed, that would cover their sins temporarily so they could enter into fellowship with the Lord. This went on for almost 1,500 years with the tabernacle and the temple, and millions upon millions of animals were sacrificed over that time frame. But they all pointed to the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus Christ. John the Baptist sees him coming towards him. He says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. 
He would be the final ultimate sacrifice for sin. He'd be the only acceptable payment for our sins. He is the one that would give us eternal life. He would satisfy all of the wrath that we deserve upon ourselves. He took the judgment upon himself as he hung on the cross, and he paid that price in full for all of our sins. And so if you put your faith and trust in him alone, he will save you. He will set you free. He'll give you eternal life. And so the blood of Jesus, it's so pure, it's so powerful that he not only covers our sins, but he washes us clean. And that's the only way you will have your sins dealt with. You have to come to Christ. Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, you can look at these verses. It says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us, much more than having now been justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. So our position is we are now justified. The Father sees you, if you're born again, as just as if you'd never sinned. That's your position in Christ. Yeah, we still stumble, we still make mistakes, we still blow it, we still sin, but positionally we are justified in His presence. We're in the sanctification process right now. Ultimately, we will be in our glorified resurrection bodies, and I can't wait for that, as this body slowly but surely wears down. So, why is it so important for there to be a shedding of blood? Because the Bible says that life is in the blood. When Adam and Eve sinned, very first sin, their sin brought death into this world. And so they tried to cover up their own sin, their own nakedness, by sewing fig leaves together. Not a good thing to do. They're a little itchy, by the way. But they tried to cover themselves. And so when God comes into the garden, you know, he calls them out. And then we're told that he prepares animal skins for them. So the very first animal to die, and I think it was probably a lamb, was the Lord killing a lamb and clothing them with animal skins to cover their nakedness. Genesis 3.21, it says, Also for Adam and his wife, that would be Eve, the Lord, took, uh, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Uh, in other words, sinners cannot make themselves righteous or sinless, but only God can do that. God sacrificed that innocent animal in their place. And again, since Jesus is the final sacrifice for sin, His blood is the only acceptable payment for our sins. That means religion can't save you. Praying to saints, icons can't save you. Uh, going to church doesn't save you. Even having a Bible or ten in your home won't save you. It's putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. He alone has paid the price to save you. Once again, everything we read about the tabernacle, all these furnishings in the tabernacle, it all points to Jesus Christ. Again, chapters 25 to 30, we went into great detail. It took about six weeks or so to go through those chapters, dealing with all these things. So again, I'll go through these rather quickly. But picking up in chapter 35, verse 1, it says, Then Moses gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together and said to them, These are the words which the Lord has commanded you to do. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh day shall be holy, shall be a holy day for you, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire throughout your dwellings, on the Sabbath day. Now, this is the fourth time God brings up this command to obey the Sabbath day. We saw in chapter 31, this is a covenant between God and the children of Israel forever. The reason we're not struck dead for worshiping on Sunday is because God made that covenant with the Jews. It's not for us. Paul's very clear in Romans that one esteems one day above another, Saturday or Sunday, Others esteem every day alike. That's what I've chosen to do. Every day is a great day to rest in Jesus, to worship the Lord. Not just here on Sunday, but throughout the week, we acknowledge God is the reason that we have life, abundant life. And so God made it clear that if they did not obey this command, they would be put to death. And so here before they take on this big building project of building the tabernacle, he reminds them, you're going to be working hard, but Make sure you rest on the Sabbath. That's what Sabbath means, rest. Hebrews 4, Jesus is our eternal rest. And so you are to rest on the Sabbath, he tells his people. 
And God is essentially saying, as vital as a tabernacle is, don't neglect to take that day off. Be refreshed, be strengthened, be encouraged, and don't get distracted, he says, by kindling a fire. He goes, I want you to take that one day off and focus on your relationship with me. So look at verse 4. And Moses spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take from among you an offering to the Lord, whoever is of a willing heart. We'll see that phrase used a few times in this section. Let him bring it as an offering to the Lord, gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen and goat's hair, ram skins dyed red, badger skins, and acacia wood. Oil for the light and spices for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense. Onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. Again, Moses sends out the word to all the congregation. Whoever, verse 5, whoever has a willing heart, bring these articles to the central place here where we're going to build the tabernacle. So it had to be from a willing heart. The same Truth is throughout the Word of God. God doesn't want you to give because somebody's twisting your arm, somebody's putting pressure on you, manipulating you. No, it's from a willing heart. This is what it says in 2 Corinthians 9, verses 7 and 8. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. So again, those who have a willing heart. Verse 10. All who are gifted artisans among you shall come and make all that the Lord has commanded. The tabernacle, its tent, its covering, its class, its boards, its bars, its pillars, and its sockets, the ark and its poles, with the mercy seat and the veil of the covering, the table, and the table and its poles and all its utensils and the showbread. Also the lampstand for the light. We'll look at these in the next section here, a little more detail. Um, uh, oil for the light, verse 15. The incense altar, its poles, the anointing oil, the sweet incense, the screen for the door of the entrance of the tabernacle. The altar of burnt offering with its bronze grating, that's where the sacrificial animal was barbecued on that burnt offering, that altar. Its poles, all its utensils, and the laver, and its base, the laver is where the priests would have to wash their hands before they went into the tabernacle. When they came out, they would wash their hands in that laver. The hangings of the court, its pillars, their sockets, and the screen for the gate of the court. The pegs of the tabernacle, the pegs of the court, and their cords, the garments of ministry. Again, you know, God went into great detail with Moses about these garments, how they were made, had to be made out of linen, not wool. Wool, God didn't want them sweating. You know, he wanted them to be inspired more than perspiring. Uh, so the garments of ministry for ministry in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron and the priest and the garments of his sons to minister as priests. Again, Moses gets the word out. Not only does he want them to bring all these different articles, gold, silver, and things, that's important, but he's also saying, I want people who are willing to serve. And so he's putting out the word, those who want to give, that's great. Those who want to serve, that's great. It's all part of our giving to the Lord. So we need people that not only give their resources, but also those who give of their time and their talents. Look at verse 20. And all the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. Then everyone came whose heart was stirred, and everyone whose spirit was willing, and they brought the Lord's offering for the work of the tabernacle of meeting, for all its service and for the holy garments, they came, both men and women, as many as had notice, a willing heart, and brought earrings and nose rings and necklaces and all jewelry of gold that it, uh, that is, every man who made an offering of gold to the Lord. So where did they get all these valuables, the gold and silver and bronze and everything? Well, again, when God was pouring out his wrath upon Egypt, the ten plagues, and, you know, Moses went before the Pharaoh, said, let my people go. And he said, no, 
They just wanted to go three days' journey to worship the Lord. And he kept saying no. So every time, God sent a plague, ten plagues. But during those plagues, God told Moses, tell all the people, because you're going to be leaving, go to your Egyptian neighbors and ask them for articles of gold and silver, bronze, and all these other things. And so by this time, the Egyptians are so terrified of God they're like, take it, get it. Here, all the gold we got, you guys take it. And so they were hauling massive amounts of all this stuff with them in the Exodus. And so you might think, well, that would be easy for these, you know, Israelites to give this to the Lord for the tabernacle. But think about it. From their perspective, they've been slaves for their whole lives. They're in Egypt. They were being mistreated. They were being abused. They'd had their firstborn sons thrown into the Nile River. And so they could very easily justify, this is what we deserve from these Egyptians. They treated us so horribly. And so they even had to pray about that. Okay, yeah, I know I deserve this, but no, this is the Lord's. And so they, with a willing heart, will give this up for the tabernacle that God wanted them to build. Look at verse 23. And every man with whom was found blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen, goat's hair, red, red skins of rams, badger skins, some versions say uh, seal skins, brought them. Everyone who offered an offering of silver or bronze brought the Lord's offering. And everyone with whom was found acacia wood for any work of the service brought it. Again, this acacia wood was the base, what they would use when they were building the furniture, and then it was all overlaid with pure gold or with bronze, depending on what it was. Um, it was a very strong wood. All the women, verse 25, who were gifted artisans spun yarn with their hands and brought what they had spun of blue, purple, and scarlet, fine linen. And all the women whose heart stirred with wisdom spun yarn of goat's hair. Just happened to have that laying around, right? The rulers, this is important, the rulers brought onyx stones and the stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate that was worn by Aaron, the 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel, and spices and oil for the light, for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense. The children of Israel brought a free will offering to the Lord, all the men and women whose hearts were willing to bring material for all kinds of work which the Lord by the hand of Moses had commanded to be done. Again, everybody pitches in to help, including the leaders. As it says here, the rulers. This would be the, the 70 elders that they had working under Moses. Now, that's important for the leaders to step up and help. You know, they weren't just on the sidelines barking out orders. That's not a true leader. Uh, Jesus says, basically, if you want to be great in my kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. Jesus said, I did not come to be served. Here's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. So it's opposite of the world. The world wants to put the CEO up here and everybody worships the CEO and they pay him the big bucks, but that's not ministry. In fact, the Greek word for ministry means the under rower. They would be in the slave ships. They'd be in the bottom of the ships pulling the oars. That was the minister. And so don't reverse that. Don't elevate the pastor or elders. We're all in the same boat together. So Jesus, um, through his word, through Peter, says 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, Peter's instructing the church leaders, the elders who are among you I exhort, I whom a fellow elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Remember, he was on Mount of Transfiguration. He saw Jesus, and then Elijah and Moses appeared, you know, in, in glory there on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter says, I was there. I saw this. But I'm also a fellow elder. I'm a witness of the sufferings of Christ. And then he says, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you. Not below you, among you. The word shepherd there is poimano, where you get the word for pastor. And so that's the role of a pastor, to serve. And he says, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, i.e. Benny Hinn and many others, not for, by compulsion, not will, uh, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, 
again, but being examples to the flock. And so we all want to have servants' hearts. Now look at verse 30. And Moses said to the children of Israel, See, the Lord is called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, uh, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And we talked a lot about Bezalel before as well, when the Lord called him. And he has filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and knowledge and all manner of workmanship to design artistic works to work in gold and silver and bronze and cutting jewels for setting and carving wood and to work in all manner of artistic workmanship. Again, we saw in chapter 31, he would be anointed, he would be filled with the Holy Spirit, and so he would use his natural abilities in a supernatural way. And that's often what God does. He just takes us as we are, we're just simple human beings, but it's His Holy Spirit working in us and through us. That's why we are a vessel of honor. Remember what Paul says? We're just a little clay pot. Nothing special about us. These bodies, you burn them down, it's just a little clay pot. That's all we are. Same 17 elements that make up common dirt, make up the human body. And so we're just little clay pots. The glory, Paul says, is what's inside. That's Jesus. You know, we want Him to be glorified. We want Him to radiate from our lives. And so here, Bezalel, he would be equipped by the Lord to use his gifts and talents for the glory of God. And he was the one that would be raised up to oversee this entire building project. Look at verse 34. And he has put in his heart the ability to teach. In him and Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan. And we talked about Aholiab as well. He has filled them with skill to do all manner of work of the engraver and the designer and the tapestry maker in blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine linen and of the weaver, those who do every work and those who design artistic works. Chapter 36, and Bezalel and Holiab and every gifted artisan in whom the Lord has put wisdom and understanding to know how to do all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary, shall do according to all that the Lord has commanded. And so again, these two men were not only going to work hard uh, with their own gifts and talents, but they were also given the ability by the Lord. Here it says to teach others. In other words, they were to disciple others. That's what a disciple is, one who is being taught, taught how to live. You know, what did Jesus say before he ascended up into heaven? The last thing in the Gospel of uh, of Matthew chapter um, 28 verses 19 and 20 Jesus says go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them and that's what he just told you're going to do this Bezalel you're going to do this Aholiab you're going to teach others so teaching others all things that I have commanded you and lo I am with you always even to the end of the age and so all of us it doesn't matter what you're doing in this life. All of us are to be involved in some capacity because all of us in here, if you're born again, you're part of the body of Christ. We all have different roles to play, different parts to play, but we're all equal at the foot of the cross. Same as in marriage. Husband and wife are equal in every way. Now he's put the husband as the head over the family, but he's not the Lord it over the family. We're equal, but we have different roles and responsibilities. And so God is the head. Jesus Christ is the head over our church. He's the head over our families, our marriages. And, and that needs to be true in everything that we do. And when you think about it, God really doesn't need any of us. He certainly didn't need the Israelites to build this tabernacle. After all the miracles we've seen God do, parting the Red Sea, that was pretty good. Um, dropping manna down every day from heaven except for twice as much on Friday, so they didn't gather it on Saturday. Uh, water from a rock, that was pretty amazing. I mean, the ten plagues there. I mean, miracle after miracle. So he could have just spoken it into existence. There's the tabernacle. But he chose to use simple human beings to do this with him. I mean, everything we do in ministry, it's because of him leading us and guiding us. He's the head. We're just simply like, okay, Lord, here I am. I don't have much to offer but whatever you want to do with me, you know, and he sent me all over the world. And it's crazy because I look back at what a doofus I am. And it's like, God, if you can use me, you can use anybody. It's amazing. And it's kind of like, you know, when our children were little, 
Um, I think back when, you know, Bethany was three, Christine was maybe five. We were living out in the Redlands here. We had a little over an acre. So three-fourths of it was grass, had a bunch of trees on the property. And so they always like, Daddy, can we help you? I'm like, oh, great. This is going to be a lot of help. So I had a riding lawnmower because I, I, for, when we moved into the house, it's like, I've got a pushing lawnmower. This would is, this is be good exercise. Nine hours later, it's like, this is no fun. I need a riding lawnmower. So the girls, they were like, can we help you mow the lawn? I was like, sure. And so they'd you know, steer it, and we'd be all over the yard. And, oh, thank you. And then they had so much fun doing that. And then I have to go around and do it again. Uh, same with raking up the leaves. I was like, hey, can I help you rake the leaves? Yeah, let's rake the leaves. And they'd have leaves going this way and that way. Or I'd get the pile, and they'd jump in it, and they'd all scatter. So I actually did like 110% of the work because <laughs> they scattered everything, undo everything you're doing. But the point is, that's how God is with us. We think, oh, I'm going to help the Lord. And it's like, he does everything. He lets us work with him. He lets us, and we cooperate with him, hopefully. But it is like, that's where fellowship is developed. I'd never trade those days where, you know, Bethany and Christine made more of a mess. But I looked at it as, wow, they want to hang out with Dad. They just want to be with me. They just want to grow in that relationship with their dad. I mean, that's how God is with us. And then run in the house, mommy, mommy, we got to help dad do this and do that. I'm like, yeah, you helped. But <laughs> it's the point is, though, it was where the relationship, that's so much more valuable in, in sharing, you know, that relationship with them. And that's what was happening with all the people coming together as they begin this tabernacle project. It says some people brought a lot, some people brought a little bit, but they all brought something to the Lord. Some had gold, some had fabric, some had oil, some had spices, some had the acacia wood, but they all brought what they had. You remember when Jesus fed the 5,000 men, plus their wives and kids, it's probably 15 or 20,000 people, but it says he fed the 5,000 men, and he could have just, boop, fed them all. But he says to the disciples, so what you guys got? You know, they need food. Why don't you guys feed them? Well, we don't have anything. 200 denarii, 200 days wages. And that's not even enough for them to have a little bit. So he says, what do you got? And so it tells us in Mark chapter 6, 38. This is how he involved his disciples. He said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said five and two fish. And we're told... You know, Andrew says, but what is that among so many? But he just brought what they found, just five loaves of bread, two little fish, a little guy's lunchable. And so they bring it to Jesus, and then he does the miracle of multiplying. And they fed and fed and fed, and they're eating and eating and eating. They gather up 12 basketfuls of leftovers, one for each of the disciples. See, I'll take care of you. You know, I'm here for you. Don't have to worry about everything. I've got your back. And so Jesus takes that whole... That little boy's lunch, and it says that they were stuffed. It literally means they had to break out the stretchy pants. They were so full. It was like Thanksgiving. It's like, oh, man, that was good. So one thing we discover as we go through these chapters is that the Lord will place the same Holy Spirit upon Moses and upon Aaron and upon all these little people that are doing little things. No, they're not little people in God's eyes. And if they're doing, you know, spiritual things, same Holy Spirit comes upon them. They're doing physical things, same Holy Spirit upon them. When God looks at you guys, he's not saying, okay, you're the sacred ones and you're the secular ones and, you know, got different roles. No, no, no. We're all the same body of Christ. If you have a secular job, you're the, the light, you're the salt in that workplace. If you're a blue-collar worker, white-collar worker. He wants you walking in the Spirit, filled up overflowing with the Spirit, so people will see more of Jesus and less of you. It doesn't matter what you do. You can be a, a plumber, you know, a carpenter, a mechanic, whatever it is. You're doing it as unto the Lord. You can be a spiritual, you know, leader, whatever, pastor, elder. It doesn't matter. You better have the same Holy Spirit working in you and through you. Colossians 3.17. Paul's very clear on this. And whatever you do in word or deed do all in the name of the lord jesus 
giving thanks to God the Father through him. In other words, if you work in this world, you need to be filled up with the Holy Spirit of God, just as much as the person in full-time ministry. Because the reality is, all of us who are born again, we are all in ministry. We're, we're all called to be servants. We're all called to be light and salt. It's not like, no, you guys don't have to be. You guys need to. No, we're, we're all in this together. Look at verse 2, chapter 36. Then Moses called Bezalel and Aholiab and every gifted artisan in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, everyone whose heart was stirred to come and do the work. And they received from Moses all the offering which the children of Israel had brought for the work of the service of making the sanctuary. So they continued bringing to him free will offerings every morning. Now, many times in the Bible, we're told that the Jewish people were stiff-necked. Uh, they were stubborn. They were rebellious. They, they didn't obey the Lord at all times. Now, we don't pick on the Jewish people because the same things are said about the church. We can be stiff-necked. We can be stubborn. We can be rebellious. Less than 100 years after the church was born on the day of Pentecost, Jesus writes seven letters. When I was in India and I was talking about this, I said, Jesus wrote seven letters. And they looked at me like, what? We never saw letters from Jesus. It's like, no, no, the seven letters in Revelation. He wrote to those seven churches. This is before the end of the first century. He rebuked five of the seven churches for blowing it. They're doing things wrong. And he says, unless you repent, you know, don't think, oh, yeah, those Jews, they were so stubborn, blah, blah. No, we can be the same way. So don't get yourself on a high horse God does not agree with replacement theology. He still has a plan and a purpose for the Jewish people. He will fulfill it in these last days. So don't throw in the towel and say, oh, God's done with them. It's all about the church. Yes, it is about us. Jews and Gentiles make up the church, but he still has a plan. And I've talked about this many times. Romans chapter 11, 25, 27. When Jesus returns, it says, all Israel will be saved. At his second coming, that third of the Jews that make it through the Great Tribulation, when they see Jesus return, every one of them will turn to him as Lord and Savior. And then Jesus sets up his kingdom from Jerusalem for a thousand years, the millennial reign of Christ, and all those Jews that got saved, they're going to be experiencing the fullness of the promises of God that he has for them. It's going to be amazing time. So don't say God's done with the Israelites. I don't know why I went on that tangent, but be it as it may, um, this is one of those special times when all the Israelites come together. They're not being stubborn. They're not stiff-necked. They're humble before the Lord. After all, he just destroyed 3,000 of them. But they come together with a willing heart, a willing mind, with outstretched arms in order to do the work of the Lord. And that's important for us because they were united in their obedience to the Lord and to his word. They were not trying to create unity on their own or with their own agenda, but they were united in doing what God called them to do. We have a great example of this from the early church in the book of Acts. By the way, after we finish Exodus, we're going to start the book of Acts, Lord willing. Acts chapter 4, verse 32, it says, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common, with great, and with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Now, you've got to realize, this is in Acts 4, 3,000 Jews get saved in the day of Pentecost, another 2,000 get saved in chapter 3, as a result of Peter being used to heal that guy at the gate beautiful. So you got about 5,000 Jewish people, because for about 10 years, the only believers in Christ were Jews. It wasn't until about 10 years later that it finally gets to Cornelius and his household, the first Gentiles. And so the early church, they're all Jews. Now keep that in mind, because when they got saved, what did their Jewish family do? Turn their back on them. When they got saved, they would get kicked out of their house. We see the same thing over in India. 
And some of the Muslim people that were leading to Christ, when they come to Christ, their Muslim family say, we don't want you, we, we disown you. And so they're on their own. And so this is the picture that's being portrayed here. It says, And great grace was upon them all, nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each one as anyone had need. So he's not promoting socialism. He's just saying because these people have nowhere to go, nowhere to turn. They've lost their jobs because they became a follower of Jesus. Some of the wealthier people said, well, we're going to take care of you guys. And we're going to come, we're going to rally around you. And we do the same thing today over in India. Unfortunately, our flesh can get in the way of, of what true unity is in the Holy Spirit. You know how easy it is for us to say, you know what, I'm going to do this my way. I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care what you say. I'm going to do it my way. Now, when the Apostle Paul was in prison, this is what the Holy Spirit inspired him to write. Ephesians 4, starting in verse 1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to, it's an important word, keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That word to keep means to guard you were to guard the unity that you have in Jesus. He's not saying go out there and create unity because when the church tries to create unity with other churches, you know what ends up happening? You water down the truth. And you end up compromising what God's Word says. Just so you can get along with this group over here because they don't believe this that the Bible says. They don't believe it. So, okay, well, I guess we'll compromise here to agree with them. No, that's not the unity he wants. We, we are to guard the unity that we have. In Jude verse 3, it, it tells us that we are to contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all given to the saints. So we're not trying to create something. We're to guard what God has given us. We must never compromise God's word just to try to get along with others. The early church learned this right away. Um, again, they're all Jews. Peter, John, the rest of them. And they're telling everybody in Jerusalem all about Jesus. So the religious leaders, Jews, came to them and said, you need to stop telling people about Jesus. Stop using that name. So this is what they said. Acts chapter 5, verse 29. That Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. That's how true unity is guarded, by the way. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Think he's trying to be politically correct there? No. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. So also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. So again, genuine unity is only found where God's word is believed and where God's word is lived out. You don't, don't try to unify with those that don't hold fast to God's word. Look at verse 4. Chapter 36, 4. Then all the craftsmen who were doing all the work of the sanctuary came, each from the work he was doing, and they spoke to Moses, saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded us to do. So Moses gave a commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman do any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. And the people were restrained from bringing. For the material they had was sufficient for all the work to be done. Indeed, too much. I mean, this is truly a work of the Holy Spirit. There's no other way to explain this, because over and over again it says, Whoever has a willing heart, bring an offering. The Holy Spirit places this willingness upon our hearts. And sinful, self-centered people are never willing to part with material things unless there are strings attached, unless there are certain conditions met. We've had people in the past that say, oh, I'll give this to the church, but I want this done. I'm like, I, keep your money. I don't want it. You know, I remember years ago, somebody came to Pastor Chuck and says, I'll give you a million dollars. And he goes, okay. He goes, but I want this and this and this. And he goes, no, keep your million dollars. 
I mean, that's tough to turn down a million dollars. Any of you guys want to give a million dollars? No, just kidding, just kidding. But, you know, when people put strings attached, you know, a lot of people, they just want to give to be noticed. They want to give to be recognized. They want to be get, they give to be applauded. Um, they have to have their picture on TV or in the newspaper or something. And I've heard too many pastors over the years say, you know, things like, well, you need to give till it hurts. That's not God's attitude. God would say, if it, if it hurts, don't give. Again, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. I uh, quoted it earlier. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. If anybody ever feels manipulated to give, don't give. If anybody feels like I'm being coerced or you know this pressure, don't. It has to be from a willing, cheerful heart. And when we have that kind of relationship with the Lord where we know that He loves us and He has provided everything we need for life and godliness, then we can trust what he says in his word, such as Philippians 4.19. And my God shall supply all of your need, not greed, all of your need, right? According to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Psalm 23, verses 1 through 3. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. And so it's all about Jesus. But anyway, this is an amazing scene here that is extremely rare. We've got to restrain the people from giving. I have never once heard anybody on TBN, any of these phony televangelists, have you ever once ever heard them saying, don't give any more to us? Stop giving, that's enough. Are you kidding? They'll never do that. They, they want more and more because of their greedy, lustful hearts. So here, the people of Israel bring more than enough to build the tabernacle and everything that goes into it. So I'll quickly cover verses 8 through the rest of this chapter. It says, And all the gifted artisans among them who worked in the tabernacle made ten curtains woven of fine linen, of blue, purple, and scarlet thread with artistic designs of cherubim, they made them. If you want to put that first picture up, oh, there you go. So the one on the far right, that's the one he's referring to. That's the covering. That would be what, when you're inside the tabernacle and you look up, it was all these beautiful pictures and the cherubim, so it reminded them of heaven. And then skip down to verse um, 14. He says, He made curtains of goat's hair for the tent over the tabernacle. He made 11 curtains. So the next one back, that was all made out of goat's hair. And again, when we went through this in detail, this all points to Jesus. The scapegoat, they would lay their hands on the scapegoat. They would slaughter the one, lay their hands on the others. And that scapegoat would run out into the wilderness, taking the sins of the people out into the wilderness. As far as east is from the west, God remembers our sins no more. And then the third one uh, mentioned there in verse um, 19, it says, Then he made a covering for the tent of ram skins dyed red. So you see the red one there. Uh, the ram skin, that represents what Abraham, getting ready to slaughter his only son, sacrifice Isaac. And just as he's getting ready to strike him, the Lord says, No! And so he stops. And what's in the thicket was a ram caught by the horns. He slaughters the ram, sacrifices a ram, and that's what that represents. Jesus is the ultimate lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And then in the same verse, verse 19, it says, and a covering of badger skins above that. And so the final one, some again say seal skin, some badger skins. It was kind of the weatherproofing over it, but it was very, very plain. It was nothing like, ooh, that's really pretty. It was very plain. But, again, it's a picture of Jesus. In his earthly body, he was very normal. He was a Jewish man walking around the people. He didn't walk three feet off the ground. He didn't have a halo over his head when he was on earth. He didn't glow in the dark. Remember, Judas had to identify him with a kiss there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Very, very ordinary looking man. In fact, it says in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 2, for he, speaking of Jesus, shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness or attractiveness. 
And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. In other words, in his physical body, Jesus was very ordinary. So that's what these four coverings represent. And uh, again, he goes into all the little details here, the rest of this chapter about the boards, all these little sockets, the little gold rings. And we talked about that earlier. So look at chapter 37. We're going to blow through this. But these are very important. Chapter 37, you can put up the picture of the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Testimony there. The first few verses refer to this. Then Bezalel made the Ark of Acacia wood. Two and a half cubits was its length, so about four feet wide. A cubit and a half its width, about two feet deep. And, about, uh, and a cubit and a half its height, so about two feet high. He overlaid it with pure gold, inside and outside, and made a molding of gold all around it. You know, this is the thing that Indiana Jones was after, remember? And he cast for it four rings of gold to set in its four corners, two rings on one side, two rings on the other side of it. He made poles of acacia wood, overlaid them with gold. You can see the poles there, just acacia wood, very plain, but the gold over it, again, all this picture is Jesus. Very ordinary. He was a human being, but God with us, represented by the gold. Um, verse 6, he also made the mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits was its length, about four feet wide, and a cubit and a half its width. He made two cherubim, as you see there, of beaten gold. He made them of one piece at the two ends of the mercy seat. One cherub at one end on this side, the other cherub at the other end on that side. He made the cherubim at the two ends of one piece with the mercy seat. The cherubim spread out their wings above, covered the mercy seat with their wings. They faced one another. The faces of the cherubim were toward the mercy seat. Again, this was the main article of furniture in the whole tabernacle. This was the place where God's Shekinah glory was above the mercy seat. We'll see that in chapter 40. The very end of this book ends with God's glory coming down and above this. What was inside the chest? It's a big chest. What was inside it? The two tablets of the Ten Commandments. God's law was in it. So you've got the law, which we can never keep, which the Jews couldn't keep. You've got the glory of God above. So what went on top of the mercy seat? The blood. The blood of the Lamb, once a year on the Day of Atonement. What a picture of Jesus. We're sinners. We can't keep the law. Jesus, you know, the, the Father is perfect and holy in every way, but Jesus bridged that gap, so to speak, through his blood. Now we have access into the presence of the Lord. Look at verse 10. Here we see the table of showbread. The next picture. He made the table of acacia wood. Two uh, cubits was its length a cubit its width, and a cubit and a half its height. He overlaid it with pure gold and made a molding of gold all around it. He also made a frame of a handbreadth, you know, little finger to your thumb, around it, and made a molding of gold for the frame all around it. He cast for it four rings of gold and put the rings on the four corners that were uh, at its legs. So you can see the poles going through. Remember, everything about the tabernacle, it was sacred, but it was portable. It had to move whenever the glory cloud, the pillar of fire, or the pillar of cloud, whenever that moved, they would have to fold everything up, the whole sanctuary. They'd have to roll up all the, the fencing around it. They'd have to roll, you know, put the poles, they'd be in here. They'd have to lift it and carry it. Nothing could be carted. It was all hand carried. And so everything had to be portable. Verse 14, the rings were close to the frame as holders for the poles to bear the table. And he made the poles of acacia wood to bear the table and over them, uh, overlaid them with gold. He made of gold, uh, pure gold, the utensils which were on the table, its dishes, its cups, its bowls, and its pitchers for pouring. So again, this is the table of showbread. It's about three feet wide, about 18 inches deep, not very big. But what went on top of this was the 12 loaves, the 12 pieces of bread representing the 12 tribes. And it pictures the Lord saying, I'm going to provide for you, my children. I'm going to take care of you. Every week, they would take out the bread, replace it with fresh bread. The priest could eat the bread. David got hot water for doing that, but be that as it may, um, Jesus says, no, it's okay to do that. Why? Because Jesus is the bread. 
He's the bread of life. You know, we're, we're, we're told again in uh, John chapter 6, 32, then Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So they said to the Lord, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. And so again, Jesus is the, the showbread table. He's represented there. He's the one that will sustain us. He's the one that fills us. He's the one that keeps us going until he calls us home to be with him. All right, look at verse um, 17. He also made the lampstand of pure gold. And again, we went into detail about this. Of hammered work, he made the lampstand. Its shaft, its branches, its bowls, its ornamental knobs, and its flowers were of the same piece, and six branches came out of its sides, three branches of the lampstand out of one side, three branches of the lampstand out of the other side. There were three bowls made like almond blossoms on one branch, like uh, uh, with an ornamental knob and a flower, and three bowls made like the almond blossoms on the other branch, with an ornamental knob and a flower. So for the six branches coming out of the lampstand. And on the lampstand itself were four bowls made with uh, like almond blossoms, each with an ornamental knob and flower. There was a knob under the first two branches. And remember, this was all, the, the only light in the tabernacle was this lampstand. And, and so there were seven receptacles, and that was one of the jobs of the priest. Every day they had to make sure the lamps were trimmed, they had enough oil, they would burn continuously. So what does the lampstand represent? I'll mention that in a moment. Look at verse 22. Their knobs and their branches were of one piece. All of it was one, here again, again it says, hammered piece of pure gold. And he made it seven lamps, its wick trimmers, and its trays of pure gold. Of a talent of pure gold, he made it with all its utensils. Again, we look at this in great detail in chapter 25. But this gold lampstand was hammered out of one piece, one talent. How much is a talent? It's between 75 and 100 pounds. So that's a big chunk of gold. And from that one chunk of gold, Bezalel makes this lampstand. Um, in Jerusalem today, there's a 60-pound gold lampstand that's outside. It's in Jerusalem on the, I, can't, I think it's on David Street. But um, it's in this big plexiglass covering, and it's pretty amazing to see this thing. It's made, it's made by the Temple Institute there. They've got all the stuff for the new temple. <laughs> they think it's going to be a temple for the Lord. It's actually the Antichrist temple. But they've got all this stuff ready to go, and that's one of the things they have. And it costs millions and millions of dollars to have that much gold to make a 60-pound. Well, this one was nearly 100 pounds hammered gold. How does that picture Jesus? Well, he was beaten for us, bruised for our iniquities, chastisement for our peace was upon him. By his stripes were healed. Again, Isaiah 53 speaks about Jesus being hammered. It, it, the, it pleased the Lord to bruise him, it says in that chapter. Now, again, this is the only true light in the tabernacle. There's only one true light because light in the Bible represents truth. There's only one truth, and that's Jesus. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, 1 John chapter 1 tells us that in God there is no darkness at all. He's the light of the world. Now Satan comes along with a false light, a false truth. And this is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. He says, and no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. So you got to be careful. There's a lot of false religious ideas out there, a lot of false doctrines out there. This is why you got to study to show yourself approved. you got to spend time. Genesis to Revelation, period, is God's word. And so anything that contradicts God's word written by man, other religions, it's a false light. And a lot of people claim, oh, I found the light. 
Then you start talking to him, and it's like, no, Maharishi Wackadoodle is not a light. That's not truth. you got to go to the Word of God, the truth. John chapter 8, verse 12, And Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. I mean, he's the lampstand. I'm the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So real quickly, we'll finish this chapter, verse 25. He made the incense altar of acacia wood. Its length was a cubit and its width a cubit. So about 18 inch square. It's not very big. So you think, oh, it looks pretty big. No, it's only 18 inches square. Um, two cubits was its height, so about three feet tall. Its horns, those little protruding things in each corner, were of one piece with it. And he overlaid it with pure gold, its top, its sides all around, and its horns. He also made for it a molding of gold all around it. He made two rings of gold for it under its molding and by its two corners on both sides as holders for the poles with which to bear it. And he made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. So again, had to be portable. This sat right up against the veil. So you remember... Can you go to the overview one? So if you're coming from outside the tabernacle, the tabernacle courtyard, that fence all around, is 150 feet long, 75 feet wide. If you're coming from the right, you come into the courtyard there. The very first thing you have is the altar of burnt offering. It's a, that's the four and a half feet by four and a half, or no, seven and a half feet by seven and a half feet, four feet tall altar. That's where the animals would be sacrificed. And then the red dot there in the very middle, that's where you'd wash your hands. The priest would wash your hands. Then they go into the tabernacle, the little gold-looking thing there. You go through there. On the right side is the table of showbread. On the left side is the menorah, the lampstand. And then the little square close to the Holy of Holies. See, the square is the Holy of Holies. On the far left, that's where the mercy seat, that's where the ark was. So right up against that curtain was this altar of incense. It was to be perpetually burning with a special recipe that we talked about earlier. And it had to be burning. What did it represent? The prayers of the people. In the book of Revelation, an angel is told, go to the altar of incense, scoop out some of those coals, which are the prayers of the saints, and they're going to cast them down to the earth. What prayers are those? How long, O Lord, until you take vengeance on our enemies down here? And so God is like, time for judgment. That's what the book of Revelation is about. So this altar of incense, it represented the prayers of the people. The veil, that's Jesus. And he's there interceding, praying for you and me today. So it was a very important article. But they all, again, point to Jesus. Finally, verse 28, it says, or verse 29, it says, He also made the holy anointing oil. And that was a specific recipe. You could not deviate from that recipe, or he said you'd be put to death. You could not use that oil on anything but to anoint this place and the priests that would work there. You couldn't use it at home. You couldn't say, oh, this is a nice lotion. No, no, this is a very specific thing for a very specific reason, a very specific recipe, and the pure incense of sweet spices according to the work of the perfumer. Again, when we look at this, very specific ingredients, and you can never take that home and burn it in your house. I've had people over the years, oh, you know, I came up with that recipe as it's described back in chapter 30, or 30, I think it is. And I'm like, don't do that, dude. God says he'll strike you dead. You're not to do that. It's only for this particular thing. And so it's the same with the Word of God. This is God's recipe. This, these are his ingredients. You don't deviate from what God has told us. You hold fast to the truth of his word. You don't say, well, you know what? The Bible says this, but, you know, we're living in these days, and so I think we need to adjust what the Bible says. No, no, no. We're to adjust our lives to what the Bible says. Don't ever adjust the Bible to what culture says. That's where we see so many churches blowing it today because they're trying to be culturally relevant. You and I should say, you know what? I want to be biblically relevant. I want to be Jesus relevant. I don't want to blend in with the world. I don't want the world to like me. I mean, I don't want to be a jerk when I'm out there in the world. But my goal isn't for them to like me. Their goal, my goal is that they need to see Jesus. 
They need to hear the gospel. They need to turn from their sin and turn to Christ for eternal life. If your heart is broken for the lost, ask the Lord to use you because he want, he's looking for people that will say, here I am, Lord, use me. I want to be a vessel of honor for your glory. I want to share the truth of who Christ is with the lost and dying world around me. And he will because he loves everybody. Jesus was sent on the, to die on the cross for all of our sins. Unfortunately, wide is a road that leads to destruction. Many are turning their back on the Lord. But narrow is the road that leads to life. And we know that narrow road is Jesus. The way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I know we covered a lot. I know we kind of rushed through some of these things. But Lord, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for loving each one of us here. We thank You that You have a plan and purpose for all of our lives. Lord, You want to use us as vessels of honor for Your glory. Wherever we are, wherever we live, wherever we're working, Lord, help us to be that light and salt to those around us that need to know that Jesus Christ is alive, risen from the grave. And it's only because you're alive, Lord, that you are moving among us, wherever two or three are gathered together in your name. You're here in our midst. And Lord, I know that you stir us up. I know that you knock on people's uh, hearts, uh, knock on the door of their hearts. If anyone will open that door, you'll come into them. You'll dine with them and they'll dine with you and they can experience eternal life as they surrender their life to you, Jesus. For all of us here that are believers, I pray that you would pour out your spirit upon us afresh and anew. Yes, we all have the Holy Spirit in us. He'll never leave us or forsake us, but Lord, are there rivers of living water flowing in and out of our lives? Or are we quenching and grieving the Spirit because we're too much in the world? Lord, I, I pray that we would not settle for just a little trickle of the Holy Spirit working in us and through us, but Lord, the rivers of living water would pour into us and flow out of us. We just want to be conduits, Lord, of your goodness and your grace, your love, your compassion. And I pray that we would have eyes to see the, those around us who are hurting, those who are struggling. Lord, our brothers and sisters, even here, that are going through difficult times, death in the family, death of a loved one, seeing a child wander off, get caught up in the things of the world. Whatever it might be, Lord, I pray that you would meet their needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you would wrap your arms around them and use us, Lord, to come alongside and be a blessing to those you bring into our lives. May we always point people to you, Jesus. You're the answer, you're the solution. And we commit our ways to you now, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, if you want to come up Saturday at the church camping trip, so we know how much food to prepare. <laughs>